I actually think people might need to consider desiccation. Uh, I actually became personally interested in this approach, mostly because of a previous study that we did on night spraying. George, do you mind handing these out for me? So our night spraying study was a lot of fun. That was one of the ones that kind of got me first involved in some of the research around here. And, and a lot of the application things like sprayer tip, coverage, time of day, actually really matter when it comes to spraying desiccants. So the next thing that led me to a, a, more of an interest in this is that I decided to grow seed alfalfa on my farm. So you have a really, really green crop at the end of the year and you have to figure out how to desiccate it. But then you're into September and October, all the environmental conditions change. There's different products to use, different rates. And, and in fact, you know, had a real bust on one of the times that we were trying to desiccate that crop and realized that, you know, there's, there's, there's something to this. We need to pay attention to it. So I've put together three different little demo trials across this poor sacrificial durum crop that we have here. Uh, we did it obviously not at physiological maturity, but we've got some very good visual effects. These plots are demonstration plots, so I actually wouldn't mind if you guys came in here and ripped out plants and really looked at it because it's gonna be garbage after today. So come on in, look around, and uh, maybe I'll even get some people to come help me pull some plants. Who, who's feeling like they wanna get in the crop and have some fun here? So what do you guys know about desiccation? What's, what's important? What are some considerations? Marketing. 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 Why does that matter? Uh, the guy who's buying your crop might not want to see any desiccant on it. That's the big issue with desiccation right now. Okay, so we have to make sure we're careful with uh, residues in crops when you're marketing them. Uh, very important for seed growers as well. You don't want to get anything into a seed that may affect germination. What are the main products for desiccants? Reglone. So that's a Diquat Group 22. That product works by interrupting photosynthesis. It actually creates like a free radical and literally blows up the cell wall. So it, it is very effective, but it doesn't move around in the plant. So it is very much a contact herbicide. And that means we have to do the best job that we can to cover as much as that crop that we can. So that, that's, that's a really important consideration. So, so timing is a really good point, and we're going to talk, that's the last demo, so we'll get there. Anything else we know about desiccation? So there's the weed control approach to it as well. Are we going to control weeds with Reglone? Not really. not really. We're going to burn them down. It's not really a strategy for dealing with perennial weeds, so if there is a weed control approach, which uh, we often have problems with around here as we're developing more resistance it seems that that uh, per perennial weed control is becoming a bigger issue and so is the the tolerance as well so if if herbicide or sorry weed control is your number one goal then you need to move to a systemic product like glyphosate and it has to be done you know a lot of times you can spray glyphosate and then go again with Reglone if the dry down pieces so uh, we, this isn't always a big deal in southern Alberta. We tend to have enough of an environment to get proper dry down, but if things keep going the way they're going, this might actually be a really big year for, for both fall, pre-harvest, and post-harvest weed control, as well as desiccations. Whereas other parts of the country where you move up north, they have a shorter growing season, they really rely on these techniques for, as a harvest management tool. So we're going to focus more on how the product works more than anything. I'm not going to get too much into the timing of, of the crop stages and that sort of things. That's kind of like what George is talking about. That's important to make sure you nail that one so that you're not having any residue in your crop. It's important. But today, this first step here, we're going to look at some of the coverage factors. So obviously, you guys know water volume. What's the right water volume for Reglone? 120 liters an acre. 120 liters an acre. Is he right? 20 gallons an acre, that's right too. They're both right. Actually, 120 is a little more than 20 gallons. So when you talk to folks about 20 gallons an acre, that's, that's a tough sell. Um, if you look at the plots that I'm going to show you, it's an easy sell. So five gallons an acre, kind of your typical herbicide rate. 
That's actually what they're doing in aircraft. So desiccation through aircraft is pretty tough because they don't have that water volume issue or that opportunity. So here we have another, another layer is not just the water volume, but the, the droplets. So different nozzle types. What, are the, what do you think would be the right nozzle type for this? You go in with your herbicide coarse nozzles? Probably that's what happens. Yeah, if you get the water volume up high enough, you might be able to get away with the coarse one. But really, more coverage comes down to finer, finer nozzles. So that, that's going to get more droplets. So I, I, Mike, you going to come in here and help me out? No, he doesn't need a mic. I just want you to pull plants. So here we've got the T-Jet at five gallons an acre. If you look at the, the burn down, and we can pass these around, you can actually look at the coverage on the leaves. So this is no different than using that water sensitive paper. You get a pretty good sense of the coverage. It's not great. This was sprayed last Friday night. So we've had a full week with the Reglone Reglone Ion actually has the surfactant built in. That's another piece of the puzzle, is what do you do with surfactants and drift control agents that will change how that crop is wetted? So Mike's moving on to the 10 gallon per acre and passing that around. Did you already do that? So we got one of five. Grabeer's got two five, so here we got the 10. You can visually see there's an improvement right here at 10 gallons an acre with the T-Jet. But you move down to the 20. And we've actually got quite a bit more burn down. So if I'm looking here at the leaves, Matt, actually it looks, it looks like a good portion of the leaves are burnt down. These products aren't designed to spray on crops that are green like this, so it's not going to be a perfect kill. If this was towards harvest, you'd have 100% dry down. But basically, very, very good visual demonstration of how that water volume piece makes a big difference in the dry down of the crop. So let's keep following along with me. Yes. Correct. We're, we're still going to get into that, so hold it. The timing, time of day. These plots right here, Friday night. Beautiful time to actually spray. Uh, the mosquitoes were horrible. I have to give a shout out to Trevor Deering. He did all the spraying for me. And we had a, I had a lot of fun hitting the different rates. I, I had him running a full sprint to hit 19 kilometers an hour for the five gallons an acre. That was on Twitter and it was a blast. So we had a good time with that. So now we're moving to the more common nozzle. This is an air bubble jet. This is the one that most guys have and spray on just about everything. So it's a much coarser droplet. And well, Mikey, you, did you start pulling plots again? So here we have the five. You can see there's a lot of green in the heads, even compared to those T-jets lower down, but not a great job done in the burn down. Moving to 10. A noticeable difference. And then there's the 20 gallons. We don't really, even at the 20, so keep coming down folks. Please even make a circle, get in here and, and check it out because there is a lot going on. When you look at the front of the plants versus the back of the plants, that's where speed actually becomes an issue. So. What do you think sort of a maximum speed you should do while desiccating? This is the 10. Five miles an hour, no, that's a little slow. Eight to 10 is good, nothing wrong with that. So is this the 10 gallon? That's the 10 gallon, or, and then, yeah, you got the 10, and then Mike had a 20. Yeah, big difference. So most recommendations is don't go more than 15 miles an hour. And the reason for that is as you're flying, that droplet has a velocity going forward. So you're going to be hitting the crop coming in like this, and you're not hitting anything backwards at all. So speed will actually mess up your ability to get good coverage. And everything that I'm talking about, this is so related to fungicide application. And, and fungicides are sprayed all the time. Half the time people don't know that they work or not. 
I think there's a ton of work that we need to do in really fine tuning our fungicides applications because this whole idea of prophylactic application, I don't even know that they're doing a job. If you go in with a five gallon an acre coarse nozzle on a fungicide, I guarantee you're not getting your results. And, and that's, that's a waste of money in my opinion. So the real positive approach to this is, I mean, this is nice that it has good drift control. So we have to be careful about um, things like inversion. There was a beautiful inversion this morning not beautiful if you're trying to spray but this morning and last night you saw the dust was just sitting everywhere i could smell feedlot from 10 miles away um, absolutely the wrong time to be spraying when we move to this this is a five gallon an hour treatment it actually looks not too bad doesn't it this is with the twin jet so this is the t-jet type nozzle so it's a fine spray but it has two sprays goes like this and as you're spraying, then that the idea there is, and this is also what they like to talk about for fusarium head blight, is you're going to hit the fronts and possibly the backs. Again, speed is going to really matter on this one. But at a five gallon acre rate, the T jet does a or the twin jet does a really, really nice job of coverage. So if it's good at five, it's going to be better at 10. And it is, you can see quite visually striking difference. And then up to 20 here. I actually think this is probably one of our best treatments. So now you, you think about the coverage piece. What about the different types of products? This was all Reglone. Let's take a look now moving forward. Everything's at 20 gallons. So that's the recommended rates of water volume. But we went with the uh, air bubble jet because that's usually what farmers are using. You know, that's that multi-purpose nozzle that everyone's using. So now we've got Reglone at the low rate. So there are different rates of, of Reglone based on the crop, based on the weed intensity. Uh, it ranges from about 0.83 uh, liters per acre to I think 1.6. So this would be the 0.83 and here's the high rate. So obvious, very visual response to a higher rate. Uh, definitely makes a difference. And again, the front of the plot here is actually, I, I think a little bit of carryover from our two meter boom. We use little, little two meter booms, like I said, Trevor's running through there, so we should have mowed the front out, but in between is obviously where it hasn't been sprayed. So what about, um, in your package that I gave you, there's a sheet on a product called Interlock. Maybe somebody give that a quick read and tell me what, what's, what's important about Interlock. Anybody know what Interlock is? <laughs> you have to quickly check your sheet to figure out what it is. It's not really, I guess, an adjuvant. It could be an adjuvant, but it's, it's more of a drift dispersal agent. Is that right? Is that what it says? So a disposition aid. So I think what that's trying to say is that it will help go on the leaf and spread out. This is a contact product. So they actually use it to help control drift but if what our goal is is to try to get as much coverage on this leaf as possible that's what it's supposed to do i actually think i can see a visual response to the interlock here so interlock no interlock so from what i hear within the industry and i have to actually thank the, the folks from agro plus because he donated the interlock for me i use this on my field as well and it, it goes there's also a lot of generics out there when it comes to desiccants as well. So that's a little bit confusing. The Reglone is the, the sort of the, the gold standard. It's been around forever, obviously went off patent. It has the surfactant built in, but you can actually add this interlock to Reglone or to a generic. If you're going with a generic brand, and in this case we used Guardsman, there's another adjuvant called High Activate. So this is the High Activate plot here. And actually looks very, very similar to the Reglone. And I'm not surprised by that. It is the same product. It's just different surfactants. The interlock piece though, I'm a little bit interested in that because of the fact that I've seen a visual response. I've been hearing good anecdotal stories about it as a tool. And even the Syngenta folks like adding it. Um, so all these other little things that can help disperse that droplet onto the leaf to improve the coverage is a positive thing. So as this is important for a desiccation approach, 
keep thinking about the fungicide approach too, because I think we can do a lot better job with fungicides. So let's keep common. Got to keep moving. We'll get done quicker and you can get in some shade and have some lunch. So here we have glyphosate. Now this took a little bit longer to react. So what we've, we've been six days, seven days, but you know, after about four or five days and we've had really warm conditions, we've had really good uh, growing conditions, the glyphosate is actually acting a lot faster than I expected. But on that note, do we expect the same level of dry down from this as a reglon? What do you think? No? Okay, well it all depends. I'd actually say you're wrong. If you wait two weeks, it'll dry down. The difference is the reglone will act within a week. So it is about timing. If you're wanting to get that crop off, nothing is gonna dry down as fast as the reglone product. If you have lots of time and you're doing a pre-harvest, you're going after thistles or something like that, I really think that the glyphosate approach is good, but it isn't, it isn't gonna dry things down. And, and of course, if it's a seed production thing, you really have to be careful that you're at physiological maturity. You do not want to be spraying that ahead of time, especially for the seed growers, because that's just going to mess up germination. But anyways, it is drying down better than I expected, but it's, it's given the weather. Another thing with Reglon that I didn't talk about is what's really important, or maybe we should save that for the environment piece. Yeah, we will. Any questions on this? Okay, we'll keep rolling. This plot here we added in heat. So heat is also used as a desiccant. Um, it's a different mode of action. It also blows up the cell walls in a different way. It's, I can't remember, OPP inhibitor or something like that. It's, it's again, something in that, that cell wall. I don't know that I visually see an improvement over the glyphosate this time. I have in the past. It does give a faster burn down. But then heat alone, for whatever reason, just didn't do the job this time. So I have to check into what the heck happened here, but I'm not seeing a heck of a lot of response to heat. Does that seem weird to you guys? Clean Start is another product. So Carfentrazone is a contact herbicide that will help burn things down. So these are both have registrations on the desiccant front. They're just not quite as effective as that Diquat. But there are other options there. And then we've got Liberty here. So slower to act but definitely is starting to have a more of an effect doesn't really compare to the reglon in my opinion okay last little session if you can come a little bit closer this is an important piece of the puzzle and george was asking it right off the bat why would timing matter george uh, time of day time of day time of day matters time of day matters absolutely well not actually time of day it's the amount of sunlight okay there's two different things you're getting into here then Time of day or sunlight? So what's important about sunlight? Well, what activates the, the activated green reglo? Sunlight. Why? It produces a free radical. Oh. So, so where do you want the product when this happens? As much into the cell as possible. Right. If you spray it on a bright sunny afternoon, like today, well, it's not that bright sunny, mm -hmm. you're not going to see nearly the effect as if you spray it at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Overnight allows it to get into that cell and then the free radical will, will then explode that cell much you're partially right, also partially wrong. You want to have sunlight, absolutely, because it acts in photosynthesis. So that part is right. You actually want to shoot for probably two days of intensive light. We actually got that in this demo. So you can see we did a really good job on the burn down. The reason you spray at night is because of the coverage. So what, what, is, what is it about the environmental conditions at night that's different, say, during the day? Sorry? When you say night, More water. do you mean after dark? Or do you we're, mean after we were like 9 o'clock. Between 9 and 10 is when we sprayed. Evening. Yeah. So it's a bit cooler. The stomata of your leaves are open. Cooler. And the stomata's open. Okay. That may play, play a factor. Should be more moisture in some. There's more moisture. You're, you're getting into it, but not quite there. Higher humidity. So humidity is really important. So what's, what's that going to impact? Now, by spraying at night, say it's in the middle of the day. How much evaporates? Uh, or I guess coverage, basically. There you go. So that, that's really what it comes down to. 
If you spray in the middle of the day, think of those droplets. They hit the leaf. Do they spread out and stay there and, and, and get good coverage? No, they evaporate really quickly. So this is that evaporative effect. When you spray at night, it essentially, if you've got dew, you've got humidity, it's going to slowly have its time to spread out. If you've got the interlock piece where it changes the surface tension of the droplet, it'll spread out more. Your coverage is so much better in the evening. That's really what it comes down to. The daylight coming after is, also, is, is the important part that helps activate it. So two different pieces to the puzzle. And this is what we have here, and it actually showed out really, really well. So we sprayed, here's the Reglon in the morning. First thing in the morning, you can see pretty green, eh? Didn't do that well. Here's the afternoon, so right around noon or two o'clock. And then here's the night one. So that's a dramatic difference. And, and I, I'm actually very pleased that the plot shows that to that level of degree. When we did the night spraying study, we really got into this concept of delta T. Does anybody remember that? What's delta T? That's, yeah, you've got the sheet on there. So delta T is essentially a measurement of the evaporative uh, <laughs> So the hotter the temperature, um, coarse droplets versus fine droplets. So now when you get into a high delta T environment, like right now, your fine droplets even though you're getting better coverage, are going to evaporate faster. And they're going to drift more. So there's always this balance of getting the coverage in the right environmental conditions. That's why nighttime with a fine droplet works better. But there are times where a coarse droplet might work better if you have too high of a delta T. So that's, that's the wet bulb minus the dry bulb. So we talked about your evaporation thing. It's basically you take a thermometer and wrap it in a wet cloth. And if it's windy, then that's going to actually cool off the temperature because it's like getting out of a shower and then you've got that wind on you and it's cold. Whereas if you have high humidity, it's not going to feel as cold. So that humidity piece versus temperature is what gives you a different delta T. So the delta T will be much lower in the evening. It's a higher humidity, a lower dry down, better coverage piece. So all of those factors play into doing a good job on the desiccation. In this case, our early morning was 21 degrees already. Humidity was 55% here. So we actually had pretty good humidity and it was just partly cloudy, but really a failure in the application. The afternoon here, we were up to 31 degrees. It was a stinky hot day, just like today. Humidity was 40%. 40 um, surprisingly, I actually did a little bit better response. Whereas in the evening here, we're now 17 degrees, 75% humidity, and 20 degrees soil temperature. Partly cloudy that evening, but we had two good Sundays after. So it really kind of helps demonstrate that impact of, of time of day, coupled with the coverage picture, the rates and the right products. This kind of shows how to do a good job of desiccating. So I hope. Yeah, and that's, that's it's a lot more challenging when the environment changes. And that's where it probably doesn't matter as much that you spray in the evening, but you want to have that activation period afterwards. So to get those sunny days after in September matters a lot. When I, I this last year spraying my own alfalfa at home, perfectly thick green canopy in October actually. And I was really worried about that because, you know, I want to get this crop off before it snows. So I went in with that uh, high rate of the generic uh, reg loan, and it was only about 14 degrees the next two days, 14 to 18 degrees, and used the interlock, and I was absolutely amazed at how good of a dry down it did. So it can still happen without the 20s and 30 degree days, but that's when I'm not so sure spraying at night matters. You can check your humidity, check your temperature, um, probably make sure you got your coverage and your volumes there. Uh, you know, do everything right, and you can still do a good job even in, in the, the later months. Any other questions? Any questions from the folks online? Are you guys there? Ken, water volume and humidity is so important. Has anybody looked at chemigation of desiccants? So the question was regarding chemigation of desiccants because water is important. I know a lot of farmers do. 
In fact, a lot of farmers will actually irrigate a quarter inch before they desiccate for that reason. So there's some cool tricks that are going on. I don't think there's actually been any studies on it, but there is something there. Uh, I know some other farmers who have actually tried to apply through the pivots. I don't think that worked out all that well for them, but um, yeah, it, it just, my, my guess is it dilutes the product a little bit too much. So I'm, I'm, I don't know that there's actually been any scientific studies on that, all, all only farmers playing around. Yeah. Any other questions? Nobody online? Okay. Online people, you're failing me. We need some, need some questions in the afternoon. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time and uh, hope you enjoy lunch. <laughs>